All right, welcome everybody and happy Archaeology Month. So every October is Virginia Archaeology Month and we're gonna kick things off by sharing some of the work that we're doing in the archaeology department here at Monticello. Um, first things first, I'm Corey Sattis and this is my colleague Chris Devine. We're both archaeologists here at Monticello and we specifically work in our archaeology lab. Um, we thought today we would share some of the work that we're doing in the lab. Um, which is uh, really cool and dynamic. And um, specifically, we're gonna talk a bit about legacy collections today. So a legacy collection is essentially uh, a collection of uh, artifacts from excavations that occurred in the decades before our modern archeology span department. Um, and these are really, really great uh, for a number of reasons, but can also be super challenging. Um, so I know we'll talk about some of the specific projects that we're working on, but uh, Chris, sort of in your experience, how would you summarize some of the ways in which legacy collections are both useful and challenging? So legacy collections, because they're dug uh, in some cases before the methods that we use today for excavating and also analyzing and recording information, those different techniques sometimes makes it difficult to understand exactly how the project was done and also how the artifacts were both uh, labeled and recorded over time. Uh, the fact that some of these collections have been archived for many decades means that we don't necessarily have the institutional knowledge uh, as, to, as to how they were organized. Um, sometimes the site reports, the, the written information, doesn't necessarily tell us uh, specific things that we would like to know. So there are a variety of, of challenges, uh, but I think we're gonna talk today a little bit about how we're able to overcome some of those challenges and take advantage of some of the wonderful information and, the, and some of the interesting artifacts that were found during those earlier projects. Yeah, and to echo Chris, I, I think one of the things that really sum, summarizes those challenges is that they're usually done with different methods than we would typically do archaeological excavations today. So for example, um, I know we've shared a lot about our current project, Site 30, which is a late 18th century dwelling site uh, lived in by enslaved Africans here on the property. Um, and uh, we have been, you know, a part of that project from, you know, start to, you know, at some point we'll finish. Um, so that has been entirely a part of our, our modern department. Um, and in the lab, we do process those materials, but we also do work on these legacy collections, which just were done using different methodology. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of where we have to tease out um, the contextual information. So where things were found and, and essentially how they came into the lab today. Um, and so uh, we are currently working on three of these legacy collections in the lab. Um, so we have a Paisunir uh, collection, which was excavated in 1957, Marcotic, which is in 1958, and then the North Yard Project, which is 1985 to 1989. Um, so I'll kick us off with talking about the North Yard Project. And um, if we could go to slide one of the PowerPoint, um, you can see where this is located on the property. So this is an aerial view of the Monticello mountaintop. And you can see that yellow square is highlighting the north side of the mansion between uh, the first roundabout and uh, the paved road that currently cuts through there. Um, this was excavated by archeologists Bill Kelso and Barbara Heath in the late 1980s. Um, and they wanted to excavate this area north of the main house in order to get an understanding of how this space was used during Jefferson's time here. Um, they specifically wanted to look at where the carriage turnaround was in this area, um, as well as uh, the Haha -Ha and the North Privy. Um, and so, and they were looking at some of the drawings that Jeff Jefferson did in the 1770s as sort of a way to inform their investigation. Um, so what is really cool about this collection is that it has a very diverse assemblage 
of artifacts um, and very large number of artifacts that have been really great for our study collection in the lab. So we've got a, a wonderful assemblage of comparative materials so that when things come in to the lab from Site30, for example, we can look at other examples uh, that we have in our study collection in order to better identify the artifacts that come in. So the North Yard has been really great for that. Um, additionally, it offers a really cool perspective into trash related materials that are directly associated with the main house. And one of our goals as we begin to process these artifacts and catalog them into the DAX database. So this is the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery. Um, once we catalog everything into that database, we can then compare these assemblages with other uh, artifacts and assemblages from, for example, Mulberry Row, and start to look at what are the comparisons between the materials being used and discarded from the house versus those being used and discarded on Mulberry Row and therefore more directly associated with enslaved peoples. So it offers a really good understanding of how life is varied even on the mountaintop. Um, so we're, we're excited for the analytical value of the North Yard once we're able to process it. Um, but as Chris mentioned, um, this isn't super easy breezy because we do have to sort of interpret uh, a lot of the spatial data and where these artifacts are coming from and what we can sort of rely on. Um, so today in the archaeology department, we separate, and most archaeologists do this, right? We, ex we separate, um, you know, a full site like Monticello into different projects. Um, so for example, each building on Mulberry Row has its own project name. Um, and we wanted to also have a project for North Yard that was sort of its own isolated assemblage that we could then compare to others. Um, and we define projects by sort of excavation campaigns, which typically have the same spatial associations as well as the same methodology. And, um, and this is a really helpful sort of um, paradigm, if you will, for, for us organizing legacy collections. Um, which weren't always, you know, using the same methodology, right, or even sort of sticking in the same space. Um, so in the 1980s, a ton of artifacts from this area in the North House were all, or the North Yard, were boxed together. But we needed to parse that out based off of these rules in order to better analyze them. Um, so if you'll go to the next slide, this is a digitization of that area north of the house. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed a slide. This is actually a really cool, uh, just sort of montage of the many awesome artifacts that come from North Yard. So tons of ceramics, glass vessels, personal items like buckles, which is one of what is on the bottom right, buttons and coins. Um, so just reemphasizing, you know, how great it will be to have this collection in our database. Um, so now the, yeah, now the next slide. <laughs> um, so this is a digital map of that area north of the mansion and sort of every square that has a number in it, that is a unit that was excavated in the 1980s. And you can sort of see it's, it's, a, it's a little all over the place and they're not all the same size, right? And they're not even always on the same sort of grid, which is important in archeology span so that we can track where something is coming from. Um, we call that its provenience. Um, so we really sort of needed to parse out all of the artifacts that were originally boxed with the North Yard. And essentially what we decided on as a team after much work and discussion together, we pulled out the artifacts that are specifically associated with the privy. Those are the ones in blue. And then we also have these uh, contexts that are from units and trenches that are off grid. So they're sort of skewed. Those are the ones in green. We pulled those out as well. And we're able to decide Finally, all the ones you see colored in yellow, those are the ones that we are now saying uh, we can, you know, they have the same methodology and they have the same spatial association. So we're pursuing finally cataloging them all into the North Yard project. Um, so that's well underway. We probably have about a third of it cataloged. It's pretty massive. Um, and Chris was working on it some over COVID as well uh, before we were fine-tuned these uh, these decisions. Um, but now we've got 
three analysts in the lab, including the two of us. And so we're all um, moving forward and, and that's our top priority aside from the Site 30 artifacts that continue to come in from that excavation. Um, so that'll be really cool once that's finished. Um, other than that, we, like I said, we've got two other legacy collections that are uh, currently being assessed and um, that's predominantly Chris's wheelhouse. So I want to <laughs> toss it over to her to explain what's up with that. So the collections that Corey just referred to, these were artifacts that were discovered during two different excavations in the 1950s, the late 1950s. Uh, a little bit of historical background to that. At that point, Monticello had hired James Baer, who was the curator of Monticello. Baer and the foundation decided that they would like to uh, explore Mulberry Row more closely and identify the workshops that Jefferson had built along Mulberry Row. They also wanted to find evidence of the retaining wall for the vegetable garden. To that end, uh, James Baer was able to recruit two young uh, anthropology doctoral students from Harvard. Uh, their names were Oriel Pysenier and Vladimir Markotic. In the summer of 1957, Oriel Pysenier came to Monticello and he excavated an area roughly from the joiner shop up to the 1809 stone house. So if you could uh, please, um, there we go. Um, so what you're seeing on this slide is, um, um, I'm sorry, if you could go back to, oh, sorry. Uh, you're seeing a map that uh, Peissner drew of his excavation. Uh, he used a methodology that we do not use anymore, but was popular during this period of time. He dug trenches, uh, narrow trenches, oftentimes perpendicular to one another, and the intent was to try to find architectural remains. Uh, that was our goal, to identify structures. Um, this method, just as an aside, was actually used initially by restoration architects, both in Colonial Williamsburg, as well as Monticello earlier. Um, Peisinger also was interested, uh, to a lesser extent, in recovering artifacts from these areas as well. Uh, again, the goal was to identify structural remains. So as a result of this excavation, he did uncover four structures along Mulberry Row. And you can see there are some old black and white photos showing um, both his trenching as well as uh, he went ahead and exposed an area where he did find foundational remains. So you've got the joiner shop, you have uh, the blacksmith nailery where he, he exposed the foundations there and you also have uh, Building L or the storehouse for iron. Um, the artifacts that he found, he mentions uh, some of the artifacts he thought were the most diagnostically helpful or the most interesting. Um, at this point, archeologists really were not, uh, they didn't have a lot of information that would help them date a lot of the artifacts. James Bear did try to go in later and, and provide some dating for these artifacts. Uh, but unfortunately, there was no list of everything that was found. We don't, didn't have a good inventory based on the site report. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I can show you some of the different things that were recovered during these ex this excavation. Uh, this is an interesting slide because you not only have actual artifacts, but uh, James Bear's wife, Mary, painted pictures of some of the more interesting or you might even say uh, colorful, pretty artifacts that were found. And so I tried to show you here how her renditions are very similar uh, to what we, what we actually have in our study collection. Um, I will say that some of the, the real artifacts also have some men's with them. So you're not seeing, um, you're seeing more than just what's pictured. So uh, after Pysenier's excavation, the next year, 1958, you had his peer, Vladimir Markotic, coming to Monticello. And Vladimir, if you want to go to the next slide, is focusing on um, the retaining wall or the garden wall near the vegetable garden. Uh, this map, which is, is a little bit smaller, I apologize, 
This is a map that we are actually currently in the process of adding to uh, as we get more information about the excavations and the location of artifacts. So Marcotic uses the same system of trenching that Oriel Pysenier did. He goes along the garden wall area, uh, roughly from where the current stone stable is, uh, down to the western edge of the vegetable garden. He also put some trenches in up near uh, where the saw pit is. Jefferson indicated he had a saw pit in his 1796 mutual assurance map, and also the coal sheds, uh, which um, my photograph actually is covering up this entire map, but the coal sheds, there, was all, there were also trenches put there as well. So Marcotic does recover information uh, about the garden wall. He also uncovered the ruins of the garden pavilion. Uh, he collected artifacts just like Pysenier did, um, quite a few artifacts for that matter. And if you uh, go to the next slide, um, this is showing just a collection of different artifacts actually from both excavations. So that being said, what do we want to gain from these excavations and what are the challenges? So these two excavations presented, I think, some pretty unique challenges for us. We know that the archaeologists tried to put labels on their artifacts. Labels for us today are critical because labels, our labels, labels indicate your project as well as the area where an artifact is found, the context. Uh, that's how we go about labeling. These artifacts were labeled, but we had no key as to what the labels were referring to. We didn't know if they were talking about excavation areas. We didn't know. The other huge problem that occurred, and Corey mentioned this earlier with the North Yard, is at some point, somebody archived the artifacts from both projects together. So we had a lot of boxes with artifacts from two different projects in them. So the first thing we had to do is to try to decipher the labels on the artifacts and figure out which artifacts came from which project. And for a long time, it, we were really unable to do that. Uh, our first breakthrough came when we were able to distinguish the pice in your artifacts based on how he referred to his trenches and structures in his site report. The Marcotic artifacts were just, uh, we were at a dead end until about a couple months ago, we received an old banker's box filled with documents uh, that had been stored up in the attic of the gatehouse. This is when they were restoring uh, the gatehouse. And we didn't look through those, art those documents right away, but once we did, we found the Rosetta Stone for the Marcotic excavation, which was two uh, legal size notebooks where he listed his artifacts and exactly where he found those artifacts. And so I, this uh, slide that you're seeing right now, you can see that uh, there are numbers, there are Roman numerals written in red wax pencil on some of these artifacts. There's some labels that are nothing more than a piece of masking tape with a number written on them. Based on the Marcotic finds list, we were able to figure out what those Roman numerals meant, which they were associated with a specific trench where he was digging. And we were also able to I would say 95% of the uh, artifacts able to do, separate them out into two different projects. So it was an exciting moment for us. The map that you saw earlier from his excavations, we're in the process of adding all the information that we've been able to, to derive from the finds list and the Marcotic site report and the Pice in your site report so that we're gonna have a really pretty map to show you know, how we're associating or correlating specific artifacts with specific trenches. Um, so that was a, a challenge and, and a challenge that we, I think, overcame. What does the future hold for this project or these projects? Um, what we would love to do is we would like to relabel um, the artifacts, put permanent labels on them, make sure it is clear as to which project they came from, um, 
will, before we pull anything, that has to, that has to be our first step. Then we'd like to take some of the artifacts that we believe are the most helpful diagnostically in terms of maybe interpreting the, the excavation or the areas where they came from, but also artifacts that we can use in our study collection for educational purposes. We, we teach new analysts using artifacts from our collection. We pull artifacts for our workshops, uh, sometimes even for, uh, some of these might even be good for exhibits. Um, these two archaeologists, I think, found some incredible artifacts, um, and even though they didn't necessarily dig entirely down to subsoil like we do now, I think that they were finding uh, artifacts that we definitely can date to Jefferson's lifetime, and they can really serve as great teaching tools and examples of, of what, was, what was being used at this point in history. And I think it's important to also say with all, all the projects we've been talking about, we have a really great volunteer core who's been amazing with not just helping with sort of the massive work of reboxing and relabeling and, and all of that, but also parts of these investigations. Absolutely. And I that was going to be my last thing oh, to say, sorry. but Corey and I are on the same wavelength <laughs> a lot of times. And um, I will say that... Um, so much of the work that has been done on these legacy collections has been done uh, to a great extent by our volunteers. I want to give a shout out to uh, one volunteer, Ron, who is great with uh, integrating information onto maps. So he's the one that's been compiling uh, this information in, in the map that you saw, the uh, Marcotic map. Um, Charlie, John, I, we, we could name a whole slew of people who've really been critical to our efforts. And, you know, we're, maybe if they're watching, they uh, will get, get a sense of our gratitude. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's all, always stuff going on in the, in the archeology span lab, not, not just related to one project, tons of, tons of projects. So, um, but I know we've got some questions, so I wanna make sure we answer that. So what do we got? Yeah, so we have a question online from Chester, and they're wondering, how do you date ceramics? That is an excellent question. Great question. Take Chester. it away, Chris. So we do have, over the course of years, archaeologists, historical archaeologists have compiled information looking at ceramic catalogs, um, like contextual association. So where we see those different ceramic ware types and other artifact types where we see them um, show up and if they can be associated to a building of certain date, things like that. So we have tight date ranges for 18th and early 19th century ceramics, especially. Another thing we should mention too, is that there has been a lot of research done on uh, English potters uh, who revolutionized uh, pottery making in, in the 18th and 19th century. There's been a lot of research done on, for instance, Josiah Wedgwood. Um, and because we have so, such good records from some of those potters, we're able to identify you know, when specific ware types were made, when specific designs were introduced on pottery. We often tell people that ceramics are very much like the iPhone of today. Um, the style and the technology is constantly changing and being upgraded during this period of time for ceramics. Um, it was an indication of your status and your awareness of what the newest thing was. Yeah, and that's you know another reason why it's so great to have and important to have the study collection that we do because um, they're are so many ceramics and we receive a lot of training in order to catalog and, and identify these artifacts, but we need all the time reference materials so that we can make sure that, you know, the, the wear type, the decoration or whatever is what we think it is because of that date, especially that chronological association to these different ceramic types. It's so helpful. Um, so, uh, another big plug for legacy collections and study collections as having those different ceramic types available. Any other questions in the in the chat? No. Well, Chris, is there any other legacy collection <laughs> updates that we should share? I don't think so. All right. Well, 
Um, I will close this out by making a plug for our uh, archaeology open house, which is coming up this Saturday. So we do this every year at Monticello in honor of Virginia Archaeology Month. Um, so it's this Saturday, October 7th here at Monticello. Uh, we'll be out in the visitor center courtyard from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and you are welcome to come and, and join us, uh, included with any tour admission. So this is all complimentary with admission to Monticello. Um, we'll have exhibits and artifacts and information on the current work we're doing. Um, also some family fun activities, uh, which we always love working with kids and, and, and kids at heart um, <laughs> who wanna come and, and learn about archeology. span And we will also be hosting uh, complimentary walking tours out to our current archeological site, which is site 30. Um, and these will be at 11 a.m., 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. So all the information is on our website if you go to the calendar of events um, to check it out. So please come by and visit us. Look forward to seeing you. And thank you. <laughs>